Howdy folks, and welcome back to World of Warships with Rear Admiral Jingles. So, I'm playing through the various different campaign missions in World of Warships. They're a bit like the missions that you get in World of Tanks, except they're not quite as frustrating, at least not at first. It's actually quite a smart system. The way it works is there are a whole bunch of different campaign tasks that need to be completed, and within each task there are a bunch of missions that you can select, and each mission is worth a varying number of stars. To complete each campaign task you have to earn a certain number of stars. So say for example it requires five stars to go from one campaign task to the next campaign task. So you can pick any combination of missions, any three of which can be active at a time, in order to earn those stars. Certain missions are worth more stars than others. At first glance you might think that a one star mission like this one here, win a battle, would be quite easy. This was actually one of the hardest ones. <laughs> Took me about three hours to earn this one. In some respects, all the warships is a lot like World Attacks. But what it does allow you to do is pick the missions that reflect the way you're going to play the game. So if you like to play a lot of Japanese destroyers, for example, then pick the missions that involve sinking enemy ships, causing flooding and scoring torpedo hits. If, on the other hand, you like to play cruisers, then pick the missions that involve scoring main battery gun hits on enemy targets and setting fires and things like that. It's actually quite flexible. And having just unlocked the, well, one of the Japanese Tier 8 destroyers, the Kagero, which has now taken the Fubuki's position at Tier 8, I thought to myself, uh, let's get some of those torpedo missions in. This was a very bad idea. <laughs> it may seem like a good idea. The Kagero, with a 10-point captain, uh, camouflage and the concealment module fitted has a surface detection range of 5.4 kilometers. It is the sneakiest of any of the high tier Japanese destroyers. So getting close to your target isn't really an issue in the Kagero, although you do have to watch out because you're at tier 8 now and there's lots and lots of radar about. But it's actually getting those torpedoes to hit the targets. You see the thing is when you're playing tier 8, 9 and 10 battles people don't sail in straight lines. It's very unsporting. They make it very difficult to actually score torpedo hits. So I wasn't actually doing too well in the Kagero. And I was about to give up and pick a different set of missions and jump into a cruiser. And then I noticed, well, hang on a minute, you can complete these missions in random battles with ships of tier 4 to 10. So what's around about tier 4 or 5 uses torpedoes and is ridiculously overpowered? Oh, that would be the Kamikaze R. I'll just stick my 10-point Kagero captain in there, get the surface detection range down to 5.4 kilometers, and we'll go and torpedo some noobs. It's all for science. The matchmaker tossed me into a game that was a bit of a mixed blessing. I mean, there's plenty of battleships there for me to torpedo, and there's only two cruisers on the enemy team, so as a destroyer player, that's always good news. But there's also a lot of destroyers. And two of those destroyers in particular, the Podvoisky and the Clemson, I really don't want to be getting into any gunfights with, because they will probably hand me my arse. Having said that though, the Kamikaze's guns are not too bad. In fact, they're pretty good by Japanese standards, but that's still just by Japanese standards. They only have a range of 87 kilometers, and by default, assuming you haven't taken any equipment or captain skills to buff the rate of fire and the turret rotation speed, they fire a shot every 10 seconds, and it takes them about 25 seconds to rotate 180 degrees, which is terrible by American or Russian standards, or German standards, but it's pretty good for a Japanese destroyer. Nevertheless, you definitely don't want to be getting into a gunfight with anything if you can possibly help it, and only really if the odds are in your favour, if your target is already damaged. It does have four guns, and they're all centerline mounted, so you should be able to get all four of the guns firing at the same target. This isn't like the Campbelltown, for example, uh, which has such an awkward gun placement that a lot of the time you can only really get one gun firing at the target. Your guns are definitely a weapon of last resort on this ship, but if you have to use them, they're not that bad. With this thing, it's all about the stealth and the torpedoes. Again, with camo, no concealment module, because that's only available from tier 8 and up, but with the 10-point captain and the concealment expert skill, my surface detection range is 5.4 kilometers. My torpedoes have a range of 7 kilometers, and they're very, very fast. 
They have a speed of 68 knots. It only takes 47 seconds to reload the tubes. I have three launchers. Each fires two torpedoes. And again, they're centerline mounted torpedo launchers so they can fire either to the port or the starboard side. You don't have to worry about having to swing the ship all the way around in order to get the torpedoes away from the other side of the ship. Now what tends to happen on the straight map here is that teams tend to reinforce one side, north or south, at the expense of the other. And then they just ruffle stomp the outnumbered enemy on their side of the map and then sweep down to the other side of the map and clean up. So what I'm doing here is I'm not just rushing straight north and abandoning the guys to the south. I'm heading up to the middle to see what's happening. And with my superior surface detection range, there's an emerald, there's two enemy destroyers, there's a smoke screen popping up there, so that's probably a third enemy destroyer. I've got my torpedoes away, but I've just strayed within surface detection range of that Clemson, but he's not actually paying any attention to me. And since the guns are pointing in his direction anyway, we may as well start shooting him up. And then we really do need to DD mail and get the hell out of here, because there's an emerald, and the Clemson, and they've all got better guns than I have. This could have been very, very nasty for me, but nobody's actually started shooting at me yet. I don't have the priority target skill. Um, I find that, I can't remember what it's called, but the skill that reduces the chance that your modules are going to be incapacitated is a much, much better tier 1 choice for a destroyer captain. Um, and it's only now that somebody actually starts shooting at me. I think it was the enemy of Sakazi further to the north, but he's missed. But now the Emerald is sending some good news in my direction. Minor damage. The Clemson is sending some good news in my direction, and he does actually knock my steering out. Now I have the last stand skill, and I'm no longer spotted because the Clemson's popped his smoke screen, so I didn't actually need to use my damage control ability there to get the steering back up. I'm out of danger, and the torpedoes have already reloaded, so I fire a couple of salvos into the smoke screen. You never know your luck. The Clemson may have slowed to a stop, and they may hit him. Unfortunately, we're already down two destroyers. And that's bad news when you're in a destroyer, because now there's just the three of us against the five enemy destroyers. And remember, they all have guns that are at least as good, or significantly better, than mine. My big advantage, of course, is my speed and my stealth. Managed to get some shots off at the Emerald, without getting spotted. And then just as I clear this channel and lob some shots over the island in the direction of that emerald, I do get spotted again. But there's nobody with a line of sight to me within 8.7 kilometres, which is the range of my guns. Well, nobody that I can see. So that tells me that down in the direction of that Isizushi who just popped up, there is an unspotted enemy destroyer. You see, that's the one good thing about having guns with limited range. If I can only fire to a range of 8.7 kilometres, then you have to be within 8.7 kilometres when I fire my guns to see me. And I really need to avoid... I didn't do a very good job of avoiding that. <laughs> it's going to be firing again, however. So, turn. Yep. And he's been taken out. I'm still spotted, though. Although, only for a couple of seconds. And it's not the Isuzushi. He's too far away. And it's not that T-22 over there, because he's too far away. But down there next to the Isuzushi is a smokescreen, and there's a Clemson at 9.2 kilometres. So he's probably the guy that spotted me as I cleared the mouth of that channel over there. Now, however, because I've stopped shooting, my surface detection range has gone back down to 5.4 kilometres. And the torpedoes are reloaded. So, well, it looks like the Isuzushi is turning to head into the mouth of the channel over there. So I've fired some torpedoes, but they're guaranteed to miss. Didn't fire them all, though. Still got one launcher in reserve, and the other two are only going to take 47 seconds to reload. The Isuzushi's just been taken out by a New York, and it looks like the cavalry's heading north and abandoning the southern end of the map. Now, did that Clemson... Oh, he did. He's still hanging around there in the channel. Now, I don't want to be getting into a gunfight with this guy if I can possibly avoid it, but it appears that his attention is occupied. So, we're going to see if we can take advantage of that. He's busy shooting up that Koenig to my left. He's just run himself aground, and we've got a Miyogi heading north too. Now, the Clemson only has 5.5 kilometer range on its torpedoes, so the Koenig is too far away from the hit with the torpedoes, but that doesn't mean he's not going to fire them, and I am definitely close enough to be hit by his torpedoes. So, there he is. 
Okay, my torpedoes are out. Fired them blind around the corner, hoping he was just going to come around and sail into them. He's obviously not. Guns out. Now, what's he doing? He's coming under fire from the Miyogi, which has just appeared from the south. The Koenig is also shooting at him. He's not even looking at me. There go his torpedoes. I was trying to get as close as possible to him, so that if he did try to torpedo me, the torpedoes wouldn't have time to arm. But he's completely ignoring me. That first torpedo spread was aimed at the Koenig over there. And now he's turned around, and he's probably going to get this Miyogi as well. Well, since he's completely ignoring me, and he is going to get the Miyogi, that was a really, really ballsy move from the Clemson. His engine is out. Wow, he's very, very nearly sunk the Koenig too. That was totally worth it. But I'm going to get him. That was a remarkably well-disciplined play from the Clemson captain. Uh, my hat is definitely off to him. Normally, if you're in an American destroyer and you find yourself at gunfighting range with a Japanese destroyer, you press the advantage and you use the guns on him. Um, but no, he completely ignored me. He went after the big targets. He sank the Miyogi, who was practically on full health, and he's left the Koenig with the barest sliver of health remaining. That was totally worth it. We're still lagging behind. Our ARP Congo has just nailed the enemy New York class battleship, but we lost our Wyoming right before that, so the enemy are still ahead on points and kills. And they've now got two destroyers in the cap circle. So I, I really. I was considering heading south and trying to do the same thing myself in the enemy cap circle. There is a nice big fat juicy battleship down there just begging to be torpedoed, but well. We've got two destroyers in our cap circle, and you can see the Koenig just momentarily, he's got, <laughs> only got a couple of hundred health left. There he is, after the Clemson did a number on him. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm needed up here. So it's time to start shooting up some enemy destroyers. And, yep, but you can barely even see the Koenig's health bar. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> And that T-22 just keeps chipping away at it. He's almost certainly launched torpedoes against him. In fact, yep, you can see them in the water. But that Koenig just didn't give a shit. <laughs> it's remarkable how long he lasted with the T-22 shooting at him. I mean, look at that. He's down 14 health. <laughs> but he's still charging in there. Our own Clemson's done a fantastic job chasing these guys out of the cap circle. He's scared them off with the torpedoes. He's keeping the gunfire going and now we're in the position to take advantage of their smoke screen. They're still spotted but well spotted by the Koenig although for how long I can't say. No they've got him. Well it was only a matter of time. So now it's six against eight and with the Koenig dead um, I can only really see this T-22. This Akazi who is out there somewhere has disappeared and now I can't see the T-22 either. Now the Clemson has way better guns than I do, so I'm going to go out and spot for the Clemson. There we go. There's one of the little buggers. Doesn't mean I can't shoot him myself, of course. Go on, Clemson. Why is he firing armor piercing? What the hell are you doing? High explosive, Clemson. Come on, Clemson. I was singing your praises a minute ago. Don't let me down. There's the T-22. Oh, this could be dangerous. Come on. Yep, Clemson got him. Now it's just the T-22. I'm not just imagining things here, am I? That, that is armor-piercing, isn't it? I mean, that's white tracer. Why are you firing armor-piercing at a destroyer? Well, I'm not complaining about it, certainly. Um, and it seemed to work okay for the Clemson. He took the Isakazi out at last. But, well, armor-piercing or not, this guy's fire is getting too accurate, so I'm going to slow and I'm going to pop smoke. And I'm going to fire some torpedoes. Oh, I scored a hit. Knock something out. Not sure what. Hopefully it's important. Smoke screen, Smoke screen set. Um, we really need to spot that T-22. But I don't have a huge amount of health remaining. <sighs> what to do? Ah, screw it. No guts, no glory. He needs to be spotted. He needs to die. There's five of us against eight of them. We need to nail this T-22 before his backup arrives. Oh! We've got a V-170. He's just sank an enemy Kaiser down in their cap circle. Damn it, that's where I wanted to be. <laughs> I wanted to go and play with the battleships, but no, I had to be all responsible. 
Oh, here we go. Yeah. Podvoisky, approaching from the south. Uh, well, that's a destroyer that I can see. Can't see the T-22, but not seeing the T-22 is kind of the problem, isn't it? Um, screw it. I'll pop some... Yeah, I don't really have the range. You see, we've got Emil Bertan down there to the south, and the Podvoisky's moving to cut him off. Ah, oh, no. Yeah. Enemy Kirov took him out. OK, so we... Aside from the V-170 destroyer, who's sitting in the enemy cap circle playing chicken with somebody, we've got nobody down to the south anymore. And that Podvoisky is going to be heading up north through that channel. So I'm contemplating going after him, but that's a bad idea. And it's a bad idea because... I'd be leaving the team to go and engage in a one-on-one -on -one fight with an enemy destroyer. I don't have a huge amount of health, and at best it would be a fair fight. At worst it would be a very unfair fight in favour of... Ah, well, actually he doesn't have a huge amount of health. So I might actually be able to win that fight, despite the fact that he has better guns than I do. Still, this T-22 is a significant threat, and right now he's the biggest threat. If I chase after the T-22, while he's focused on that battleship up ahead, and there's also some fire coming in from an ARP Congo, you can't quite see, he's just off to my left-hand side. This is a three-on-one fight. This is a very unfair fight for the T-22, and that's exactly the kind of fight you want to be putting the enemy ships into. Only a sucker ends up in a fair fight. I'm going to keep an eye on that Podvoisky, though. I mean, I'm detected. I don't actually know if anybody is targeting me. Although I suppose if my modules start getting knocked out and my health bar starts disappearing all of a sudden, then that's probably a fairly good indicator that somebody is in fact targeting me. We really need to put this T-22 down and then we can turn around and I can go and spot that pod Voisky and the three of us can take him out. Hang on, there's four of uh, The V-170 is still down to the south engaged in a fight with the enemy Asakazi. And he's just lost that fight with the enemy Asakazi, but we have at least managed to sink that T-22. So there's no longer any enemy ships to the north of us. You can see the pod Voisky's just popped smoke. But without the T-22 spotting for him, he's firing blind at the ARP Congo. And then plot twist. <laughs> Battle message just popped up there. The uh, V-170 managed to get a posthumous torpedo kill on one of the enemy battleships at Koenig. So, uh, there's only three of us left, but, well, there's only four enemies. And I know that Pod Voisky is down there somewhere. There's his smokescreen. Or at least... Well, I think he's down there somewhere. He could be turning around and hightailing it out of here to go and link up with his uh, surviving teammates. But if he isn't, and there's a good chance he isn't, I need to get in there and press the advantage and kill him before the cavalry arrives. But there's a smokescreen. Oh well, that's what torpedoes are for. Couple to the right side of the island. Couple to the left side of the island. And let's swing it around. Looks like the Congo is heading away. He's obviously not keen on getting any closer to a smokescreen than he has to. Particularly since the enemy Kirov has just been spotted. And that's a far, far juicier target for a Congo. And the Podvoisky's firing out the smokescreen. So... Clearly the Congo's been spotted. There he is. Oh, no, he's gone again. Wait, there he is again. Come on, Jingles. He's reversing. Damn it. That means those are going to miss. Okay, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, reload. Oh, damn, this slow reload. Am I going to... Yes, no, one hit. Not enough. He's still alive. Well, the smoke's gone, and I know roughly where he is. Still got one torpedo launcher up. We'll get it away, but I need to go and support our Congo against these guys. Oh, I've been spotted. Crap, it's him. Come on, swing the guns around. He's shooting. That's missed. Is he still reversing? He is still reversing. And I've missed. The gun's missed. The torpedoes, not so much. Enemy destroyer sunk. All skill, no luck. <laughs> and there's the Congo. This is not a great angle. In fact, there's all three of them, including the Isakazi. Now, I haven't been spotted. 
so this is good. The angle wasn't great against the Congo, but if any of those torpedoes do hit him, they're going to cause flooding, because they're going to hit him in the bows, and that's a guaranteed flooding. Regardless of your torpedo protection, you get hit in the bows of the stern by a torpedo, you're going to flood. You will have to use your damage control. Our Congo's turning away. Wise move. The Kirov down there has torpedoes. We know there's an Isikazi over there. Oh, two torpedo hits against the Congo. That was very unexpected. <laughs> and the Kirov's been taken out, so now there's just the Congo... And there's an Isikazi down there somewhere. But that Congo is... You've just taken two torpedo hits. So you know there's a destroyer out here somewhere. And he's just sitting there. Broadside on. And I don't think he's even moving. He's actually slowed to a stop. Did I knock his engine out? I'm not seeing any... Well, I'm seeing smoke coming from his funnel. So his engine's running. No flames. So his engine hasn't been knocked out. But he is just sitting there. Exchanging fire. Well, you know, <laughs> I'll take it, and that's the last enemy ship, the Isikazi, and, well, I don't mind getting into a gunfight with an Isikazi. One more shot should do it. Come on, it's no Kraken, but it is four kills, bingo, gotcha. Now, it's not a huge amount of damage, um... <laughs> You might even be able to get away with saying I was kill-stealing there a little, but it's five torpedo hits, I've caused flooding four times, and it's more than two kills. And that's exactly what I needed to get my combat missions complete. And hopefully that should be enough stars accumulated in this one battle to get that second stage of the campaign missions complete. First though, credit where credit's due. Teammates did play well, so we're going to use our complement allowance for the day on them. And then we're going to see how we did and what we need to do to actually complete this second set of combat missions. And there it is, campaign complete, let's collect our rewards. So, uh, some Victor Lima flags, we'll have those. And some Juliet Whiskey flags, we'll have those. And, yeah, more flags, fine. We'll have those too. Now that's not quite it. We've accumulated enough stars to unlock the final task in the second stage of the Science of Victory campaign. Now, we have to play at least one battle with a captain that has at least three skill points. <laughs> Apparently they do get a bit harder later on. <laughs> okay, well this sounds like a job for the USS New Orleans. This is actually going to be my first game in this ship since the beta test. Fuck my life. <laughs> Look at that matchmaking. Well, it only said I had to play a battle with the three-point captain. It didn't say I had to win or survive. Which, all things considered, is probably just as well. Yeah, we lost that one. But anyway, doesn't matter. Done it. Let's see what we won for completing the second campaign. The first campaign reward was pretty spectacular, considering how easy it is to complete the first campaign. I mean, you basically just play World of Warships, and at some point, providing you remember to actually select the missions you're going to end up with a couple of million credits worth of ship upgrade equipment. But what do we get for completing the second campaign? 125 gold. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not nothing, um, but yeah, a little underwhelming. The rewards, by the way, are significantly better if you take part in the other campaign. See, the Science of Victory campaign here is available in ships of tier 4 to 10. But there's a second campaign which runs alongside the Science of Victory, but it's for ships of tier 8, 9, or 10 only. Some of the rewards you get for taking part in that campaign are pretty impressive, culminating in an 11-point Japanese commander and the premium tier 6 Japanese destroyer, the Shinonomi, which is basically a Fubuki with a couple of changes, most notably to do with the torpedoes, but that's not bad just for playing the game. Anyway, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed today's World of Warships video. And as always, take care, and I'll catch you next time.